Good afternoon, this is Quintus Curtius, and welcome back to the podcast. And in this podcast, we're going to talk about some recent programs and movies that I've seen and uh, talk a little bit about those, why I think they're worth watching, why I think that they're interesting, and related details like that. So let's dive right in here and just deal with the first one. This this first uh, series that I've seen, it's a uh, it's on available on Netflix right now. It's called The Confession Killer, and it's a crime documentary, and it really belongs up there with some of the best crime documentary documentaries I've seen in a long time, maybe ever. It's a multi-part series, and it deals with the the details and the uh, the investigation following the arrest of the notorious alleged serial killer Henry Lee Lucas in the 1980s. Now, you may not remember who this guy was, but he was a pretty big deal back in the 80s. And I don't know if the younger generation now really has heard much of him, probably not. But he was widely touted as being the most prolific serial killer in history. And this guy was a real scumbag. I mean, to be perfectly blunt, this guy was a real, I mean, regardless of whatever he may or may not have done, he was just a real, just, you know, just, you know, what can you say? You know, he was what he was. And he was arrested in, um, you know, in the in the mid-1980s. And it soon became clear that he had killed a number of people. And he was eventually convicted of 11 homicides, but there's some doubt even about some of those. So the, the, the final body count is not really clear as to what exactly he he may have done or not done. There are some commentators who say he only killed, you know, three or four people. There are some say that it was 11. Some say it was, I'm sure, still hundreds. I mean, he eventually confessed to hundreds of unsolved homicides all over the United States, for as widely dispersed as California and Florida. But then he eventually retracted all those confessions. And what's very fascinating about this documentary is it shows just how the psychological dynamics took over when this guy was arrested, just really how that happened and how he was able to manipulate willing police officers, willing law enforcement officers, Texas Rangers, sheriffs, police, and how they also had a symbiotic relationship with him and they were able to use him or tried to use him to clear many of the unsolved homicides that were on their books that they did not want to deal with. And it's just a very, very interesting case study in psychological dynamics. And maybe that's why what makes it so interesting. The subject matter is gruesome, obviously, but what's even more fascinating is just how these false confessions can really happen and what the fallout can be from them, just how, how destructive, how harmful they can be. So let, let me kind of try to give some details here of what I'm talking about. When Henry Lee Lucas was arrested, I think, I think he was arrested on a uh, unlawful possession of a firearm charge. And then I think he eventually just, he immediately confessed to a couple homicides. And then he confessed to more. And then he confessed to more. And he was in the custody of some local sheriffs in in Texas. I don't remember if it was the Texas Rangers who who were holding him or if it was a local sheriff or or both. But, you know, in those days in the 80s, things were not handled maybe as professionally as they would have now. You know, I, I think I tend to think that now if they stumbled on a serial killer, probably the FBI would have gotten involved at the early stages. I mean, that didn't happen here. I mean, what you had is you had a perpetrator being held by a county sheriff and, you know, by the Texas Rangers. And, you know, there's just, there was just a atmosphere of unprofessionalism that just hung over the whole proceedings. They had this guy sitting in in conference rooms without handcuffs on, smoking cigarettes, drinking coffee, talking to law enforcement officers about what he had done, murders he had committed, at one point, there's even a Japanese film crew that came in to talk to this guy. I mean, you just, just, you, you, you just are really surprised at the unprofessionalism and just the contamination effect that all this would have had. I, I think none of this would would happen today, 
but this was the the mid '80s, and I think the the whole serial killer subgenre of law enforcement was not really well known as well known as it is now. So, right off the bat, you're you're surprised at the level of unprofessionalism at, at which this guy was was kept, and he he's a very very devious and manipulative person. I mean, these psychopaths are manipulators. And what they do is they will m tell you what you want to hear. They're very good at reading what their their uh, their target wants to hear and giving back that information because they want to please. Their goal is to seduce you. Their goal is to, is to con you. So this guy was very, very skilled at listening to what the law enforcement people would say and then crafting these alleged confessions around that. So that's what jumps out at you right off the bat. That's what really jumps out at you. Um, and from the other side, from the perspective of law enforcement, it's just really an embarrassment. You look at these, conf I'm not even a, a law enforcement, I'm, a, I'm an attorney that's that's uh, been doing criminal defense work for you know over two decades, and even I can see that just these alleged confessions are just terrible. They're just you know the police are leading him into it. They're allowing him to look at the case files. They're giving him leading questions, allowing him to craft his answers in such a way that it appears that he has knowledge of these crime scenes when he really does not. And this guy almost became a celebrity. You know, the Texas Rangers were holding him and law enforcement officers from all over the country would come to see them. He was almost like a circus exhibit that gave them attention, gave them prestige, gave them status, gave them power, and they exploited that. They took advantage of that and they should have known better. But the temptations proved to be just too great the temptations of trying to clear all these unsolved homicides off the books proved to be too great. And you can understand that. Everybody wants to be able to call up family and loved ones in their jurisdiction and say, hey, we solved the murder of your mother or your sister or your daughter. And those are powerful incentives, very powerful incentives. And so you can just see this, this common interest metastasizing between law enforcement, between the rangers and the sheriffs, and this psychopath, this criminal murdering psychopath. And you can see this interaction just begin to just blossom and spiral. And before you know it, he's confessed to 300. First it's 100, then 200, then 300, then 600. So it just becomes absurd. And finally, finally people began to see that these confessions were just not what they appeared to be. Now, when I say some people, I, I, I shouldn't say, you know, just people in general. There, there's a sub, what makes this documentary even more interesting, The Confession Killer, is that there's a very, very fascinating subplot, a sub story in here where you had a local district attorney, a very aggressive, very aggressive local district attorney named Vic Fiesel. His last name is spelled F-E-A-Z-E-L-L. -L. And this gentleman was, uh, in the, at the time of the, the Lucas arrest, he was the, uh, the district attorney, the DA, for uh, McLennan County in Texas. McLennan County, he was the DA there. And if you've ever worked with a rural, small-town rural district attorney's office, which I have, it was one of my it was one of my first jobs when I came out of law school. You know that there's a lot of politics that goes on in these offices. And this gentleman, Vic Fiesel, he began to question. He, this guy was a very astute, very, very, very bright guy. You can just tell. You can just tell. He began to question some of these alleged confessions that Henry Lee Lucas was making. And they just didn't add up. He could just look at the timelines and see that these widely dispersed murders could never have been done by one guy. 
you know, they would, he would be, Lucas would confess to some homicide in Louisiana or Florida. And at the time they had, they had, they had very detailed documentation of his, of his movements. They had, they had, uh, you know, bills, they had, uh, you know, you know, traffic violations, they had tickets, they had all sorts of documentation showing where he was at what time. And it was clear that he never could have done the majority or even any of these crimes that he was confessing. But people did not want to, or law enforcement did not want to hear it. So instead of focusing on law enforcement and asking questions and beginning to question these alleged confessions, people began to attack this guy. People began to attack Fizel. And anyone that's ever lived in a small town knows how these things work. That's how this works. Um, now, admittedly, this guy probably was, you know, he was probably a brash, aggressive guy. And I think he, if I remember right, I think he openly says, you know, he was interested in, in you know, he, he it was a, an elected position. Okay, I get all that. But he certainly didn't deserve what came next because what came next was a real campaign of intimidation against him by unseen forces nobody really knows it, it's it's not it's not named in the documentary but it's it's pretty clear that there were there were groups of people allied with law enforcement and any again as i said anyone that's lived in a small town knows it may not be law enforcement themselves that are doing it but uh, these guys carry some prestige in rural areas. At least in those days they did. Maybe they don't now. I don't know about now. But in those days they did. And and no one really takes kindly to uh, people making law enforcement officers look bad. And I, I can understand that. I, I get that. I can understand that. But this was just really ridiculous. According to what he's, uh, Fizel says, you know, his dog was poisoned his um, other attorneys in town were threatened to be audited by the IRS. Uh, he was accused of being corrupt. He was accused of taking money to uh, give reduced uh, to give better deals on on plea agreements. I mean, all really, really ho horrible stuff. So he was eventually indicted. I guess the FBI was called in. There was an, an FBI investigation, and there was a federal indictment that actually came down. I can't, well, I can't remember if it was a federal or a state indictment, but uh, it was a very serious matter. He was looking at like 80 years total, 80 years in, in prison. And this guy, to his credit, he fought back and he fought back hard. He hired an attorney, he hired a good attorney, and he fought back everything. He didn't take any pleas, he didn't do anything, and he won. He took his case to trial, he beat the entire case. He showed that the entire indictment was a sham, was a fraud. He won. And that's incredible. Those of us who, who do criminal defense work, you know, in a federal indictment, it's hard to win those because they come at you with everything. They come at you with everything. And this guy won. He was totally exonerated. And not only that, not only that, but then in 1991, uh, he filed a libel suit or defamation suit against some individuals who had defamed him, who had accused him of being corrupt, who had uh, uh, bought the the uh, the line that he was corrupt and, and, and an offender. Uh, he sued a local, a local news station, it looks like. And he won the biggest defamation verdict, I think, in Texas history. It was like $58 million in damages. 58 million and uh, i guess the station that i'm looking here the station that he sued was wfaa tv wherever that is now i don't know it's not clear how much of that settlement he actually got but he i'm sure he i'm sure he got many millions out of it but still he says look it's a there's a very very high price you pay i guess he lost his marriage his family fell apart he, he paid a very very high price he paid a very high price but uh Hearing about that, seeing that really reiterated to me a principle that I've talked about many times in these podcasts and also in the essays and writings that I've done is you've got to fight back when someone is attacking you, when someone is lying about you, accusing you, 
maligning you, smearing you. You can't just accept, you know, you, you have to do something. You have to do something. And this was a very, very interesting sub story, subplot in the whole Lucas, Henry Lee Lucas drama. I hadn't, I didn't know anything about this. I didn't know anything about this. And I, I had, I had known vaguely about the Lucas case. You know, I, I've, I've always been interested, I think, in true crime drama. I, I kind of like, I've, you know, I, sometimes when you're traveling, you know, you buy these junk paperbacks, these true crime stories, and you, you read them, and you throw them away. And, and I've always found those entertaining, and, and some of them are, are very good. But um, the, this is a very, very good documentary. I think it's like five episodes, five, four or five one-hour episodes. So I highly recommend it. If you haven't seen The Confession Killer, you should see it. You really should see it. It's, it's a, and it's, again, it's not so much about what it tells us about crime, but what it tells us about human nature. Human nature and how people can be willingly deceived can willingly allow themselves to be deceived when they have a vehicle that feeds into their preconceptions, their delusions, or their self-interests. That's the takeaway. That's the, that's the lesson. And this happens not just in crime, but in everything in life. It happens in, in schools, in colleges, in academia, in work, in companies, in businesses, in international relations. It happens all the time. So if you want to be a, an informed and educated student of human affairs. You need to be seeing stories like, like this. You need to be exposing yourself to these types of stories and these types of, um, these types of documentaries because they tell you a lot about what we are as, uh, uh, you know, what, what we are as people. All right, the next film that we're going to talk about here, or next, next, um, program we're going to talk about is the movie Dark Waters. Dark Waters came out just at the end of November and it stars Mark Ruffalo. And this is a movie that has a perennially relevant theme, which is corporate corruption, corporate malfeasance. And uh, if there's anything that's that's relevant in in uh, 2019, 2020, it's that issue. Again, I, I've uh, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of the work that I did as a contributing author to the the uh, Plutocratic Insurgency Reader, which you can find on Amazon. It's a a collection, an anthology of um, of writings on um, corporate, uh, you know, the the dangers that corporate control poses to modern states. But you should check that out if you haven't already. But this movie, Dark Waters, it's a 2019 legal thriller i guess you could call it directed by todd haynes it stars mark ruffalo um anne hathaway tim robbins uh, who all of which uh, do very very good uh, performances even bill pullman is in this movie and you know these guys have really aged well you know tim robbins uh looks looks very good uh, so does bill pullman mark ruffalo all these mark ruffalo puts on a, puts on some weight in this movie i don't know if he did that deliberately or or if that's just uh, how he is now but he's definitely got the vibe of the the <laughs> the the rot not rotund but the plump corporate attorney thing going on there uh, but the theme of this movie this is a a film that really goes into the details of the DuPont corporation's poisoning of some West Virginia towns with um, uh, chloro, uh, fluorocarbons compounds that were runoff or, or um, constituent chemicals of, uh, of Teflon. So basically this is, in a, in a nutshell, if I can just lay it out in a nutshell, the DuPont Corporation invented Teflon apparently. I didn't know it was originally designed as a coating for tanks, I guess during the war, but it was... Uh, it, it was developed, it was expanded and modified for domestic commercial use. And the production of this of this chemical had a lot of dangerous spin-off side effects. People were dying, people at, uh, at DuPont were dying, and uh, somehow the dumping of this chemical leached out into the ground in some rural communities in, in West Virginia. 
and livestock and individuals began to be poisoned by this stuff. And it, to make a long story short, it, it, uh, a big class action was created out of this out of this, uh, this whole nefarious set of facts. And the movie chronicles the drama that went around that. And just the, the extended fighting that it took really to get the corporation to admit fault and to settle. And how they fought everything. And it just took years and years and years to get the EPA involved, to get everybody involved. And you can say, well, we've, we've seen this all before in, in other movies. And yeah, you have. I think obviously there's, there's, there's. I think uh, you may remember the movie from the '90s, a civil action with, with uh, John Travolta. And I think there was also that um, the movie that talked about PG and E's in California, uh, nefarious toxic uh, dumping, with starring uh, Julia Roberts. Um, I can't remember what the name of that movie was, but she she played this Erin uh, Brockovich. That's what it was, Erin Brockovich. Um, that was a that was a big movie in the in the nineties. Now, now you can say these movies are kind of trite and sort of derivative uh, movies, but you know you have to you have to put something out there. The public needs to see. The public needs to understand that these things do happen, and that people do have to fight back. People do have to have a recourse, because what I like about this movie, Dark Waters, is it hammers home the point that look, the government's not going to save you. Politicians are not going to save you. No one is going to save you. If you want to create justice, you have to create justice yourself. You have to take the steps. You have to get into the arena. You have to do something. You have to stand tall. Stop looking for someone else to to pull, pick up the slack and to do your, your heavy lifting for you. And I think that's a very good message. It's a very timely message because I've gone back and forth with some of our friends on Twitter about that in recent days. And I've gotten to the point where I really think that people have to just people have to just start doing things. People have got to feel that they have a stake in the outcome. They have to feel like they have a stake in the outcome because the injustices of the world, the oppressions of the world, the malfeasance, these things thrive on apathy and inaction. And if there's anything that we have a super abundance of in America in 2019, it's apathy. It's apathy. Everybody talks a good game, but when you really come right down to it, people don't really want to do any people don't really want to do anything. People don't really care enough. Everybody's been bought off with consumer conveniences, with the dumbing down of the culture, with the deliberate slide into stupidity that many people take as an escape. It's easy to escape. It's easy to whine on message boards and talk about everybody's going to come in to get me and everybody's doing this and everyone's doing that. Well, what are you doing? You know, what are you doing? You know, we have we have people out there actually giving advice to young guys. If I can just go off on a little tangent here. We have people out there giving advice to young men. Oh, don't go drop out of college. Don't go to college. Don't do anything. Drop out of the system. Well, good luck trying to be relevant in the world today with no skills, no education, no background. I'm not, I'm not saying everybody needs to go to college. I think everybody needs to have some training in some in some trade or business. But when you've got a situation like we have now where higher education is becoming dominated by you know, women and foreigners, then that says that there's something going on. That says that, that men are being systematically demoralized. Demo they're being demoralized. They're being made to feel unwelcome i think i think they're being made to feel like they're not their their contributions are not valued it's very bad it's very very bad now i'm not going to get into a debate with people i know what's going on i know exactly the reasons why a lot of men are dropping out of the workforce that they're they're not entering higher education uh, there really is a in my view anyway there really is a sustained and organized i think campaign whether conscious or unconscious we can debate whether it's deliberate or not or not deliberate, but regardless, the, there is a pervasive anti-male climate in our culture now. That's not not really just in America. I think you can find analogs to it in many countries in the Western world, Western Europe. Uh, you don't find it so much in the uh, Latin American countries, 
in the more traditional parts of the world, but it's it's a very, very dangerous, it's, it's a very anti-male bias where essentially everything now is is looked upon uh, as uh, negative. You know, masculinity is viewed as somehow negative, somehow harmful. And again, you need balance. You know, human society was not created based on one gender. There, there's both men and women need to be seen as equally valuable and equally necessary. And that's all I think that I'm trying to say. But if you try to say that, people will try to stick smears on you, of course. You know, they'll try to say that, uh, you know, you're this or that or the other thing. And, you know, you have to, but you have to fight your corner. You have to make yourself heard. And my view is that I think there's just a very, very pervasive and, and demoralizing um, system in place, I think, for young men where I think traditional masculinity is, is, is viewed as is very is viewed as somehow negative and, and harmful. And I think that's very bad. It's very bad for society because when you treat your young men this way, society as a whole is going to it, really suffer. You're going to see the outgrowth of that in the loss of certain martial virtues. I think you're going to see a loss of productivity. You're going to see a real slide into um, into irrelevance for a nation over time. So this is really, really bad, and it 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 uh, it, it really pains me. It really pains me to see this, and I, I that's why I have a lot of sympathy for a lot of these young guys out there. I get, I understand it. I can get why a lot of guys are um, willing to drop out. They just say, you know, screw it. It's just easier just to sit home and watch video games all day, play video games all day, and just resign yourself to marginalization. Because no matter what I do, I'm getting blamed. I'm getting, I'm getting shamed. I'm getting attacked. Well, you can't think you you can't you can't do that because then then they win. You can't do that. You've got to get in there. You've got to assert yourself. And we're not so far gone that it's a lost cause. You've got to get in there. You've got to make yourself heard. You've got to stand your ground. And you've got to not let yourself get pushed around and marginalized. You have a voice. You have an identity that's worth something. You have a co contributive, uh, contributory uh, spirit that needs to be heard. And everybody's got a voice. Everybody's got to be heard. Everybody needs to be heard. Everybody should be heard. And I just don't like the venomous ethic that's taken over where everything now is viewed through this prism of of identity and gender and, and, and who's being mean to who and someone said something to me. It's, it's, it's really destructive. And this only started about 20 years ago. I mean, there were always, it was always sort of in slow burn, I think, since the 90s. But it's 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 taken off and it's become very very toxic and there are certain people that are feeding this there are certain i'm not going to get into it you know i don't want to get into the the whole blame game but my point is you have to be aware that this exists and you have to respond to the situation that 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 you're in and i, I think you have to you have to be intelligent you have to uh you can't take the bait you can't respond in in stupid unintelligent ways you have to more than ever before now, you have to educate yourself. You have to read. I put out a tweet just a little while ago, I think yesterday, from uh, the uh, former member of the punk band, the Sex Pistols, John Lydon. And, you know, you can say what you want about this guy, but this guy uh, knows what the deal is. This guy is not stupid. In fact, he's very intelligent. And he said, look, you have to read. You have to educate yourself. You have to understand who's, uh, who's trying to use you. And I think the answer is, I think the plutocracy is trying to use it. I think the answer is that there is a series of big business interests that have a vested interest in having all of us fight each other. The plutocracy, the plutocratic insurgency, which it all comes back to that. The aggregation of all of our wealth in this country in the hands of a very, very few number of people means that they don't want us looking at that. They don't want us analyzing that. They don't want us discussing that. They don't want people unified. They don't want men and women joining together to really look at the real reasons why everybody's miserable, why everybody's unhappy, why everyone's angry. So what they're going to do is they're going to try to distract all of us. They're going to try to 
throw all these bugbears and all these gremlins and goblins and imaginary demons out there to try to get get all of us fighting with each other. That seems to be the, the game. That seems to be the game. And it's it's been very effective because all we've seen since the 1990s is the, the extreme concentration of wealth that keeps going on and the middle class has been destroyed and education has been politicized and a lot of guys are deeply demoralized. They're very demoralized. And I understand. You know, I have a lot of sympathy. I understand, man. I understand. I get it. I understand. And it's hard for me. I, you know, it, it really, it, 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 it pains me. I feel a lot of anguish about it. I feel a lot of it, you know, because if I had a son, and I know this Gen Z, this Zo these Zoomers, these young guys, you know, what do you tell these guys? What do you tell them, you know, that there's very few jobs left out there, that that um, you're going to be you're going to be shamed and marginalized for no reason that you're going to be attacked for no reason but you've got to you've got to give people hope you've got to say look you know the future belongs to you this is your country too this is your country as much as anybody else's you've got to do something you've got to get in there you've got to fight you've got to be heard you've got to say something you can't just allow um, lies and distortions to become part of the narrative you have to do you just have to you just have to and that's all i'm saying so i really wish that um that people would uh would take that to heart realize that there are forces out there trying to manipulate all of us and these forces are the same forces who want to keep everything for themselves and they don't want you to have anything they don't want you to be able to afford health care. They don't want you to be able to uh, afford education. They want you marginalized because they want to steal everything. They want to steal everything. You know, and it's about plutocracy. It's about money. It's about who rules, who controls. That's what this is all about. And everything really follows from that. Everything really follows from that. And then, of course, the mainstream media will do anything to avoid talking about this will do anything to avoid talking about it. You know, what they'll do is they'll try to distract us with some marginalized dork did something over here or said something and, there's the, you know, that means that everybody's out to get everybody. It's all this pitting people against each other. It's all this very, very venomous, mean-spirited, name-calling, smearing. It's very, it's just terrible. It's very, very bad. Don't participate in that. Do not participate and tune it out. Tune it out. Do your own thing. But at some point, you've got to you've got to stand up. You know, you've got to you, you know, if somebody tries to go after you and lie about you and smear you, you have to you have to fight back. You just have to. You just have to. Anyway, that's enough of my tangent here. But to getting getting back about the movie Dark Waters, it's a great movie. It's very relevant. See it. Uh, Mark Ruffalo is a great guy. Uh, I, I've enjoyed many of his movies. I loved him in. Um, oh, what was it? Um, that movie with Tom Cruise, uh, he, did, he had a great role as this uh, cop in uh, Collateral. Uh, he's had other, I liked him also in Zodiac. He, he's a good character actor. He's, he's, he has, a, I think he's a very, very good character. And Bill, Bill Pullman is also a great guy. I wish we would see more of him. I really wish we would see more of him. And he was great in a, in a little known independent movie back in the late 90s, I think came out in 1999, called The Zero Effect. If you haven't seen The Zero Effect, see it. It's a great, great little independent film. It's kind of a modern take on Sherlock Holmes genre, Holmes and Watson, but uh, Ben Stiller, Bill Pullman, very, very nice movie, very, very good movie. So see it if you have a chance. Anyway, so those are my two recommendations here. Uh, the, 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 the two of them are... Uh, Confession Killer on Netflix, the series, and and Dark Waters. You know, I wanted to see this movie also this weekend, but it's not not around anymore. It was it was around. It was in town yesterday, but it's gone now. It was this movie by Peter Jackson where he, I think they, they will never die, or they shall never die, or they shall they shall live forever. Some something like that. It's about him taking old films from World War One and colorizing them, and using lip readers to see what the soldiers were saying. It's a World War One documentary, but I'll, I'll come across it sooner or later, but I kind of regret uh, having missed it. But that's how life is. That's how it is sometimes. Sometimes you, you, you're asleep at the switch and you lose, you lose your opportunity. So anyway, so I'll leave you with that, people. Uh, 
I'm Quintus Curtius. Good night.